Good afternoon and welcome to today's thought-provoking webinar on the nonprofit business model, government funding. I'm Amanda Nelson, the Director of Engagement at Nonprofit Financial Commons. And it's an absolute pleasure to have you all here with us today. And by us, I mean the Nonprofit Financial Commons a relatively new resource that is designed to help nonprofit financial leaders access the wisdom of their peers, and by peers, I mean all of you. We need your help to continue to build a community of experts that have been well-tested and have hands-on experience. So please stay active during and after this event. Today is just one of a series of events on the five common nonprofit business models. Later, we will direct you to where you can access the rest of the series. Today's session is on government funding, and we have assembled a remarkable panel of practitioners who will guide us through the nuances of nonprofit government funding and shed light on its attributes and demands. They will share their invaluable insights, practical strategies, and real-world experiences to equip us with the knowledge and tools necessary to navigate the rigors of this funding choice. But before we proceed, I'd like to share a message from our generous sponsor, BlackBot. BlackBot is the world's leading cloud software company, powering social good. They serve nonprofits, educational institutions, local governments, and other groups across the sector by providing solutions designed for the needs of non-commercial organizations. BlackBot's fund accounting solution Financial Edge NXT was purpose built for the complex accounting and reporting needs of the social good sector. Whether your organization is primarily funded by grants, program service revenue, or fund, fi fundraising efforts, Financial Edge NXT has the features you need to increase accountability, make data driven decisions, and ensure compliance. You can contact them at fintech marketing team at blackbaud.com for more information. And before we dive into today's discussion, I'd like to introduce today's moderators, Wade Rogers and Mark Hager, who are here to make this a fully engaging and interactive experience. These moderators are individuals with deep expertise in the financial lives of nonprofits. They will be monitoring the chat where we encourage you to ask your specific questions of panelists and each other. Remember also that we invite you to answer each other's questions. This is the exchange on which the Nonprofit Financial Commons is built. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to our first presenter, Hilda Polanco of BDO, who will lead us through an enlightening session on the opportunities and challenges associated with government funding. Thank you, Hilda. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I will also be joined by um, both presenters and panelists, and I'd like to mention the two presenters that are with me in the first part of the program. I have with me Dana Brito, who's a consultant to nonprofits and foundations. Dana is also a moderator with the Financial Commons, but today she's with us on the presentation stage. I also have with me John Summers, Managing Director at BDO, who will be sharing with us some research that has just been released on the impact of government funding and the financial health of nonprofits overall. As Amanda said, I'm Hilda Polanco. I'm a marketing managing, market managing partner at BDO, and I am going to be your host through the rest of the presentation. Before we begin, now that you know who we are, we would love to know who you are. And as part of each of these sessions, we start by asking participants just a few questions to help us understand the demographics of the organizations that make their way to our programs and be able to continue to customize the learning for the groups. So the first question is, what is your organization's expense budget? So Amanda, if you would launch that poll, we have choices um, from below 250 to um, more than 5 million, depending on what option you choose. So let's just give a few more seconds to this. And um, when I release the results, I encourage you to look around at the other participants that are with us today. OK. 
Okay, Amanda, it looks like we've got a good participation level, which you published the results. Thank you. So we have this interesting um, almost bell curve with um, a distribution of participants from uh, smaller organizations under 250 million to 25, 24% of you being over 5 million, which is fascinating and really, um, really encouraging that all organizations here are varying sizes, but are interested in this question of um, impact of government funding. So thank you so much for that. Now we're going to our second question, which is around your mission area. So if you could, again, Amanda, launch the poll and let's see what the mission area of the organizations is um, to be able to, again, understand the perspective of the participants today. Thank you so much. We know that government funding is an option for many areas of focus. And so um, glad to see, as I see some early results that we have really participants from across every mission area, um, almost every mission area noted here. Okay, I think we're in a good place, Amanda, if you could share the results. Um, so again, the largest uh, representation is from community development and workforce to then followed by advocacy and organizing. And um, let me see, look at the remainder. There we go, I hadn't made it all the way down. So you can see social services also significant presence, education, housing and shelter, um, many, many different mission areas. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And then lastly, um, I would like to go to the third question, which is now getting closer to the topic at hand, what percentage of your revenues today come from government sources, whether they're federal, state, or local, just in total? If you could share with us that composition. Um, Amanda, please launch the poll. Okay, here goes. Okay, I think we've we've reached critical response. There we go. And so 50% of attendees have zero to 25%. I welcome you and I hope that today's session will help you think through how, um, how you might consider expanding if you choose to, um, to do that. So 50% are from zero to 25. And then we have almost an even distribution with individual organizations being somewhere between 26 and 50, 50 to 75 and over 75%. When you are thinking about the content that we're covering today, I would like you to remember this percentage and um, sort of think about where this might place you in some of the opportunities and challenges that we um, are thinking about. So again, these are our results and um, I am going to continue. So in terms of today's agenda, we're going to begin by covering the business model considerations for a government funded organization. And we realize that it's not all or nothing. The percentage of funding may vary as we saw, but what are some considerations if you do choose to accept government funding? Current research that John will share with us based on um, publicly available data on a national basis. Then we have two panelists who are joining us to share their own perspective with respect to what it means to be um, funded with government dollars, in these cases, to heavy government funded organizations. We'll have some Q&A throughout after the first part before the panel and Q&A again um, uh, before we wrap up. And then we will again um, ask you for some additional feedback and share some additional resources for you. So let me just remind us all that this is a part of a five part 
series on nonprofit business models. We've already started with the, the um, earned revenue, the fee for service category. That was our first session. And today we're working on government and the implications of what it means to be government funded. And while today we will talk about lots of the opportunities and challenges that government funding presents for organizations, we wanted to begin just by giving us some perspective as to the role that government funding plays in the nonprofit sector. So this is an excerpt from the nonprofit quarterly research um, that was done a couple years back. And we can see that absolutely the um, largest, uh, of course, source is program fees from private sources, which is the earned revenue. And then we moved to um, federal government funding being the second largest funder in the sector and then state and local government as a third. So if you're thinking about scaling and growth, certainly a partnership with government allows you that possibility from a reliability perspective in terms of um, renewal, being able to predict and uh, with it come a few other considerations, which is what we will focus on today. We realize it is, again, the second and third largest um, sources of revenue. And so for many of you, you're probably wondering, is this something that we should be thinking about in terms of expanding, starting, or retaining that, that level of funding with government? So let me start by just going through some business model considerations that we have used to frame a lot of our um, conversations in these sessions. And we always start with this question of who's paying for these dollars and what are they paying for? So in the case of today, we'll be talking about government and both federal, state and city, what are they paying for and what are they not? So we begin by thinking of that as a consideration. Then we will think about what are the common risks sensitivities, challenges, what should we be thinking about when we partner with the government? And I said earlier, accept government funding because the choice to do work with government is a choice. You apply for it, you work really hard to receive the funding and then you deliver. And so this question of should I be applying, should I be actively seeking is really, um, many of the questions that came up in advance were these questions around when should I be ready? And so we're hoping that today will help us uh, think about what are the risks and then you can self-assess, um, am I ready or when might I be ready? Then there's the component of leadership capacity, leadership orientation. Doing business with government is different than doing business with other sources of revenue. So when we think about the leadership capacity, I'll say a little bit more about what, what muscles do you need to build and strengthen when partnering with government as that uh, significant source of funding for you. And then lastly, and definitely not least, this question of infrastructure. We recognize that each source of revenue brings with it particular infrastructure needs. With regard to government, we recognize there are specific systems that you need to have in place. And so part of answering that question of when am I ready is answering this question of do I have the infrastructure needed to successfully manage the government funds? So again, from what are they paying for? What are the risks? How should our leadership muscle be developed? And what are the infrastructure needs that we'll need? We will address um, all of these points throughout the different parts of our presentation. Let me start with this idea of um, who pays and what are some examples. Um, and so when we think about the who of government funding, we really are looking at three levels. There's the federal source, which may come in different forms, cost reimbursement, per unit um, sort of in, um, outcome based funding different structures, but federal is one. Then we have state funding. And so in many areas, particularly now, as we see all of the um, dollars that are coming from legislation at the federal level, those dollars typically tend to flow through the states. Now the states then add their level of management and oversight, and then they pass it on to you, the ultimate um, grantee. There may also be local 
funding, which comes in different sources, sometimes even the same dollars that are federal passing to the state and then passing through local, whether they be city government or county government. And one of the most important aspects of applying for government funding is knowing where is the original source of that dollar. So a federal dollar that gets passed to the state and comes to you through a grant is still a federal dollar. A federal dollar that goes through the state, through the local municipality, and then comes to you, that's still a federal dollar. And I say that because it brings with it certain tracking requirements, certain audit requirements. Sometimes we find that the individual source, the state or the municipality, doesn't make all that clear, the source, and then we have a somewhat of a surprise when the organization is, um, is really managing those dollars and realizes that this was a federal pass through. So we always want to understand any government dollars as any of it federal, either through pass through or, or some other means. So that's, that's a who's paying. In terms of examples of organizations that we have seen successfully manage um, federal funding and seek this type of funding, remember it's a partnership between the funding source and you. So you may be in particular areas of, of mission focus that are more um, that are that are more of a priority for the government entity. So I leave it to you to think about your mission and research whether the work that you do is a priority for government funding and whether that is a likely partner for you. We do find that community action agencies are um, often involved with federal funding. We have one of our panelists today who is from a community action agency and he will share his experiences. And then multi-service um, centers in general, since they tend to cover multiple mission areas serving the community, um, often are, are working with government funding. So this, this gets us to the who pays um, and, and some examples. Now let me cover this idea of the sensitivities and risks. Um, you will hear through, throughout the program today, both from panelists and uh, from our research, that government does come with very low or sometimes negative financial margins. So we want to be aware of that and think about how government funding becomes a part of your funding portfolio that perhaps is balanced out by other sources of funding. So there's the negative financial margins or very low meaning not paying the full cost of delivery. There's high sensitivity to process and contracting. When you embark in doing business with government, that question of what will I need in place, there will definitely be individual infrastructure levels that are needed to be able to respond to the contracting. There's definitely um, the impact of political change, change in administration often affects availability or lack thereof, and generally a very high level of restricted dollars that um, come with the government structure. And so the, the government funding structure tends to be line item, either reimbursement or deliverable, but very much um, specifically earmarked to certain levels. From the leadership capacities and what leaders need to really be thinking about to be successful, there's there's definitely a focus on political instincts, having healthy networks, being able to foresee what is to come and what is um, what might be beneficial to help advocate in terms of particular outcomes. There um, is definitely a need to mobilize stakeholders to uh, respond to needs. And then oftentimes in our experience, we've seen participate in the creation of what ultimately becomes the RFP that goes out for funding. And then lastly, this is on the infrastructure needs. So when we think about what might be needed, thinking about data collection mechanisms, very, very high on units served, what type of service, how often, the compliance, and um, not only the systems, but the culture, the partnership between program and finance, being able to come up with these uh, data tracking systems that are critical to be able to comply with what the government funder is asking for. And um, with regard to financial systems, the cash flow, as you'll see, will come up 
uh, pretty soon, as soon as our presenters start speaking, cash flow will come up. And so having systems to monitor that cash flow and be able to predict what is needed when um, is also critical. So I ask that you think about this slide, put it on your virtual wall, and sort of do your own um, assessment of how, how strong do you feel in these areas and how prepared are you um, to continue to solidify this, this funding source that could in fact be one of the elements to scale. So now I'd like to bring in a, a voice into this conversation. And um, this is Dana Brito, who has worked with many organizations during the transition into government, during government, exiting government, and um, has some words of wisdom for all of us. So Dana, I pass it to you. Thanks so much, Hilda. Um, yeah, so I think I, we, we going into this webinar, we like Hilda mentioned, we received a lot of questions to the tone of, you know, when is seeking government funding or maintaining government funding worth it? And I think Hilda covered a little bit on this um, in her previous comments, but we just wanted to really spend a little bit of time. I think regardless of whether you're seeking government funding for the first time, or regardless of whether or not you have years of experience dealing with um, these types of contracts, I do think it's worth us spending a moment just being real about the relatively predictable costs and benefits of this type of funding. And again, it's not to say that you will guaranteed to experience these things, but most likely you will um, if you are in a position where you are either seeking or managing some level of government funding. Um, in her comments before, Hilda mentioned that um, one of the, the risks or costs associated with this funding is that um, there are very clear limitations to creating substantial um, operating margins, and there's many reasons for that. I think she touched on a few of them. I think the, the first reason being is that typically government funding, whether it's federal, state, or local, tends to be very highly um, restricted and proscriptive in how those funds can be spent. So even beyond just understanding allowable costs and what's allowable and what's not allowable, um, and sort of understanding that government contracts are very much heavily focused on those costs that are directly related, related to the program and services being funded, even within those costs, um, government funding can be very highly prescriptive. Um, there's contracts that can stipulate salary caps for what you're charging uh, or what you're paying your staff. There's uh, government contracts that can be even more prescriptive in terms of how and when and where you're delivering your programming and your approach and the specific type of interventions that you're using. So that's something obviously you really want to keep in mind is beyond just the ability to cover the, the, the direct cost of the program within those direct costs are these stipulations very much in line with how we do our work and how we do our business and our values and keeping in mind, particularly as it relates to compensation, um, things like salary caps could be in direct odds with what the market is telling you or what the market is um, charging for these types of positions. So keeping that in mind is uh, really critical before, especially before pursuing or continuing to pursue government contracts. I think I, I got to this a little bit, and I, think, I know Hilda mentioned this as well, and I think it's because they are highly restricted and highly prescriptive, the ability for these contracts to really cover the full costs of services tends to be very slim. Um, and again, it's because they're highly restricted and because there's very clear rules typically around what you can charge to these contracts and what you can't. Um, and I'll get to the administrative requirements in a, in a bit, but because those tend to be very high and very heavy, very rarely do um, those costs cover, do these contracts cover the full cost. And so what that does is that it increases the, bur the, the burden to basically fundraise to cover the gaps that aren't being covered by your government contract. So there really does need to be sufficient capacity to be raising some level of unrestricted dollars before going into these just because of the limited you know, ability to cover margins going forward. I think those of you who already have government contracts, it probably is no surprise to hear about the risks associated with the timing and receipt of that funding. Um, so I think in, in the case of government contracts, because there are very strict rules on how the money is spent and also how the money should be reported, both in terms of submission of invoices and vouchers, um, it's very important to make sure those invoices and vouchers are accurate because it can be a very unforgiving forum if you get one thing wrong or a decimal point is wrong or something is listed on the, the, the wrong light item. 
Um, very often those invoices are returned back to you and then you have to resubmit and that can take time. And even in cases where your those items are submitted perfectly and without errors, the receipt of funding is very much subject to what's happening um, in the government at the time, the external circumstances. I think those of you who are in Illinois um, in 2015 and 2017, I'm, I'm talking to you from Chicago right now, are very aware of um, the budget impasse and the impact that it had on reimbursements. And a, a lot of social service agencies suffered and had to secure um, lines of credit or had to really spend down their reserves to basically mitigate the really um, extended time period through which organizations could receive funding because of that budget impasse that was happening at the state level. So really thinking about your cash position before you're going into these, um, these types of contracts is huge. And then the final piece that's part of this unfortunate but predictable formula is, the, again, we sort of hit on this, but the admin requirements are huge because of the restriction levels. Um, and I think having one to two funding agencies is one thing, but when you're dealing with eight, 10, sometimes 15, depending on the size of your organization, depending on your programming model, each of those can very often have different um, reporting requirements, different allowable costs. And so it basically um, amplifies the administrative burden. And so really thinking about the systems that you have in place from your accounting system and making sure you can track your funding through many dimensions, through the agency, by program, making sure you have some level of ability to allocate and calculate direct and indirect costs is huge. And also making sure that you have the staff capacity and expertise to really perform that billing and invoice and report submission well and consistently and accurately as possible is huge. But I think because of all of these, you know, unfortunately somewhat predictable costs um, and risks, it can really make it very challenging to build high profit margins and to really manage your cash through government contracts. So it's not that we're discouraging it. It's really just making sure that you're going in eyes wide open when you're um, seeking and when you're managing on an ongoing basis these types of contracts. So we've, we've spent a lot of time talking through the risks and the costs. So why why pursue government contracts in the first place? Um, I think Hilda mentioned this a little bit before, but while they definitely come with very legitimate um, and significant risks and costs, they can be a tool through which potentially, not always, but potentially you could secure very substantial amounts of annual income through government contracts. And uh, particularly for those that are structured as a multi-year contract, you have the ability to secure that and, re and potentially rely on that for more than one year or many years. And so especially organizations that are trying to scale a particularly successful intervention and, and if you have that partnership with already with government agencies, this can be a really powerful tool to expand your impact and expand your reach and to do so in a way where there's some level potentially of reliability of funding. But doing so, uh, again, really ensures and depends on your ability to manage those costs and risks that we talked about. And so some strategies for doing that include making sure you really understand the cost and risk that we were talking about, and particularly as it relates to each contract, really digging in and understanding what is allowable and what isn't allowable. Um, I think Hilda mentioned at the, during her um, comments about really understanding where your money is coming from, particularly if it is coming from the federal government, because that will, particularly if it is passed through, really make, paying attention to that and confirming that as early as possible, because that does come with some very real compliance requirements and regulations. It also comes with the ability to understand and know and really potentially negotiate your indirect costs which can be a really big tool in terms of ensuring your full cost coverage. So really understanding the costs and risks associated with each of your contracts is huge and hugely important. Like I mentioned before, making sure that you're doing everything you can to build the systems and the capacity to make sure your invoices and reports are submitted as accurately and efficiently and quickly as possible to help mitigate delays. Again, it may not be you may not be able to avoid that um, entirely depending on what's going on in, in your local municipality or your state or what's going on in the federal government, but doing so and in ensuring that these reports and, and invoices are submitted accurately and quickly can help sort of streamline that time period and ensure that funding is received as quickly as possible. I mentioned this a little bit before. I think it's really, especially if you're dealing with federal contracts, really understanding 
and being not being afraid to understand and negotiate your indirect cost rate. Um, Cause I think most likely many of you are spending more than that 10% uh, de minimis rate uh, allowable under federal contracts. So really digging in and understanding the full cost of what it takes to do the work and being assured that you're maximizing the allowable rates available under indirect costs, particularly for federal contracts. And then I think the, the biggest consideration going into the, uh, government funding in terms of maintaining it or securing new sources is that making sure that you have the ability to fundraise to cover where government contracts won't cover. So especially for organizations, depending on your, your fundraising capacity, depending on where you're located, and depending on your access to private donors, whether that be individual donors, um, private philanthropy, corporations, that ability to uh, subsidize what government contracts can't is really huge and should be um, very seriously considered, especially if you're um, interested in pursuing for the first time government contracts or interested in growing this area. Because if you're growing your government contracts, you're literally just growing the subsidy need necessary to cover what those contracts aren't covering. So making sure that fundraising capacity is there and, uh, and you know, sufficient is very huge. So with that, I will pass it along to Hilda. Thank you, Dana. Thank you so much. And so um, I mentioned that as soon as anyone started speaking, you would hear the word cash flow. And so I want to make a connection now to what we um, historically have shared with many of you in prior webinars. It's this idea of a concept called liquid unrestricted net assets. We lovingly refer to that concept as Luna and really uh, want you to be thinking about what are your levels of liquid unrestricted net assets? These are net assets that are available to you for two purposes. For liquidity, meaning working capital to float receivables to upfront expenses. It's that internal credit line, if you do not have access to an external credit line, that allows you to navigate this, this world of uh, sometimes delayed funding. Luna also is um, a means of security to maintain operations for unexpected losses in funding, for unexpected delays in particular funding. So it's really your, your flotation device that you have available to you. Now the calculation of Luna is really, um, it's, it's as we have here. We start with our unrestricted net assets from your audited financial statements or internal financial statements if you're not audited yet. And we back away anything having to do with e-liquid assets. So that would be your buildings, your leasehold improvements, equipment. Can't really meet payroll with that, although it's very important that we um, recognize if we do have those assets. When we back them out, net of any mortgages, if we're talking buildings, we have this level of operating reserves that we call Luna. And that is often measured as a um, average of, um, or the number of months that can be covered with of average expenses with that amount. So we take the Luna balance and we divide it by the average monthly expense that you have on an ongoing basis, and that is your months of Luna. So it really represents how many months of operations could you cover with your Luna balance. And now just to ask you what you might be thinking or how you might be thinking about this, we would love for you to share with us I call this the sleep at night factor. How many months of Luna would allow you as an executive director, as a leader, as a board member to sleep at night so that the director is, is um, able to, to manage the organization in a strategic way rather than crisis management? So how many months of Luna should an organization have to be healthily liquid? Amanda, you want to launch that poll? Um, can you please um, add your answers into the chat for us, please? That one is not in our selected polls. Thank okay, you. let's see. Okay, the scan is telling me as low as three. I see some six plus, six plus, four. Oh, this is this is cool to watch. We're all watching. So I think I saw one entry that was one to three months. And then um, I saw three and above, um, would love six, but three to six is more realistic. So thank you. 
Thank you. And um, I see we're still getting some entries. So I saw six, six to 12. Um, so there's some feedback just about too many dollars in Luna might be perceived negatively by a funder. I can talk about that a little bit later. So thank you. Thank you for involving um, uh, all of you in, in this process or, or responding. So we, we've given a lot of thought to Months of Luna at, at BDO and how this Months of Luna is really this, this factor of financial health and understanding nationally, what, uh, what is the state of the sector as it relates to Months of Luna? And we had a hypothesis that we wanted to, to sort of um, look to see, is there a correlation between the levels of government funding and the levels of, um, of Luna balances? So now I'd like to have John Summers, who conducted this research, join us. And um, I have a few questions for John, and also John is going to share some, some of the data that he found as he researched the 990s. <clears throat> so first, John, I'd like to welcome you and ask you, um, so what does the data show about this relationship between government funding and the key financial metrics? And as I allow you to answer, I'm going to share for the first time your um, results with the group that is here with us today. Um, great. Uh, so thanks, Hilda. And I guess thanks for starting me off with a relatively easy question. Uh, sometimes when you look at data analysis, you have to kind of squint to see the relationship or you have to parse some advanced statistics, but this one's pretty obvious. So uh, the percentages you'll see along the bottom on the x-axis of the graph is the percentage of a nonprofit's revenue that comes from government grants. And then the y-axis, uh, the vertical shows the median months of Luna, as you were describing earlier, that's the uh, orange line. And then also the same graph, we have the median months of cash on hand, that's the gray line. So just looking at this, it's obvious that the higher levels of government funding are associated with lower cash on hand and lower Luna. And in particular, you'll see there's kind of a cliff there at about 85 or 90 percent when the Luna and cash really starts to drop down to only one or two months there at the uh, all the way at the end of the graph at 100 percent. And these are medians, remember, so it means that half of all organizations at those percentages have even less cash or, or Luna than we're seeing here. Um, also, we don't have the graph here in this presentation, but in the paper that we will share after the session, you can see the same relationship holds between government funding and profit margin. So that's another metric that's impacted here. And of course, if you have a low profit margin, then you aren't generating reserves and you aren't, aren't uh, building your cash balance. So these things are all, are all related. Um, and so just on the quickly on the data itself, this is based on Form 990 filings, IRS, uh, uh, filings from their database from around 130,000 organizations. So I think we can be pretty confident that what we're looking at here is a real uh, causal relationship between government funding as a business model and nonprofit financial health in terms of these metrics that we're looking at. Thank you, John. And you might, uh, all who participated in that quick chat survey, uh, you might find yourself um, along the way in terms of where where is your percentage back in that original um, poll and where, where do you see your months of Luna, which I hope you will calculate after, um, after today's conversation. So I'd like to stop sharing uh, the chart and ask you, John, we've covered some things um, that may be reasons, Dana and I, but what, what are you thinking might be some of the reasons for this? Yeah, I think we've touched on a lot of these already. Um, I guess the biggest reason is that most government grants are in essence sort of spend all funding agreements. So you basically have to match every dollar of the grant to a dollar of expenses, right? So in that type of arrangement, there's really no way to generate a surplus that would allow for accumulation of reserves and building your cash balance. Um, the best case scenario is break even basically. 
Um, and then the further problem is that this, this best case scenario often doesn't happen. So Dana was saying earlier, uh, many grants don't actually cover the full costs of service delivery. And many grants don't have indirect cost rates that are at all adequate to the operating and administrative costs of the nonprofits that are delivering the services. So if breaking even is the best case scenario, lots of organizations aren't breaking even on the grants, they're running a deficit on them. So that's what you know, gets them into these situations with low margins and, and inability to, to build reserves. Um, and then one more reason is that a lot of these grants are reimbursement based, which means that you spend the money and then you send in a report or an invoice and the funder sends you a check for what you spent. So a nonprofit with one of these contracts is basically advancing the funds, so kind of a free loan to the government, and then waiting for reimbursement, which can be a long wait in some cases. And so that's likely to result in having lower levels of cash on hand. And then one more twist is that if you have to take out a loan or a line of credit to fund your operations while you're waiting for payment on those grants, the interest that you're being charged on that debt it normally is not reimbursable on the contract. So that's going to cut even further into your profitability. Thank you, John. And, and would you say that all government is equally uh, as challenging or are there some nuances that you'd like to share with regard to the different types of government sources? Um, that's kind of yes and no. So all government funding is going to require a level of compliance and budget management and reporting that you're not going to see associated with private funders, uh, right? Because private funders don't have anything like the level of scrutiny and accountability that public agencies have to deal with. And that scrutiny gets sort of passed down to the nonprofits that they're contracting with. Um, and again, almost, almost all government grants to nonprofits are meant to be again, at best financially break even. So building surpluses and reserves from government funding is typically very difficult. Um, but in a lot of ways, state and local governments pose challenges that federal funders don't, particularly in cash flow. So on the federal side, federal grants generally allow for funds to be drawn down in advance. Uh, and also with federal funders, there's a process for developing and negotiating indirect cost rates. You know, Dana was talking about that earlier. Um, so you can, you know, often negotiate an indirect cost rate with a federal funder that tends to do a decent job of covering those kinds of costs and certainly better in most cases than state and local. Um, so sort of pivoting there, the situation is very different for funding coming from the state and local levels. And again, we're we should know that we're talking about 50 states and hundreds of you know, cities and counties. So there's obviously going to be lots of variation, but typically the state and local levels is where we see the real headaches uh, when it comes to late payments and slow reimbursements. And we're talking you know, six months, nine months, a full year, sometimes after delivery of services when these reimbursements are, are being paid. Um, also, that's where we see inadequate funding for the work, low indirect cost rates, um, those sorts of things. So the data that we were just looking at kind of blends it all together um, because the Form 990 doesn't distinguish among sources of government grants. But my guess would be that if we could see those graphs, that we that graph we looked at earlier focused only on the state and local government levels, the results would be even more dramatic. Um, and then one other nuance here is that the data that we're looking at does not include Medicare and Medicaid funding, which is it's reported in a different way in the 990 and it tends to work differently than the kinds of uh, grants that we're talking about here. And so John, um, we've now from different voices, different perspectives talked about some of the challenges. From what you've seen in the research and just your experience, what, what can leaders think about um, when, when doing business with government to make the best of the situation, knowing that it is such a potential funder and uh, such a potential for scale and uh, reliability? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really a lot of the same things um, that Dana was talking about earlier. So I think the thing that government that organizations probably have the most control over because we can't actually speed up reimbursements in a lot of cases, um, you know, in almost any case. Um, but what 
what you do have control over is to have your system set up to get those budgets and reimbursement requests and reports and invoices, all that stuff sent out, submitted as quickly as possible. So it's going to take some time after you submit the invoices to get paid, and we can't control that, but we can control how long it takes to send the bill. So the quicker we can do that, the quicker we get paid, even if it is still going to take a while. Um, so that's one. Um, two, again, back to the cash flow. We know going into this work, especially at the state and local levels, that cash flow is going to be a problem. So do whatever you can to identify other sources of working capital. Um, and this is really important because without money in the bank, we can't make the hires and we can't pay the staff to deliver the services. And if you aren't doing that, then you aren't incurring the expenses that you need in order to charge the funder. So you're not going to maximize the contract. You're not going to collect all your indirect costs. So it's kind of a vicious cycle that can really put a hole in your budget and your financial health. So whether it's cash reserves, if you're fortunate enough to have that, or advances, if you can get them from the funder, line of credit, bridge loans, whatever the source, you have to have some working capital to kind of set things in motion and make the whole thing uh, function. And then the last one, again, Dana mentioned this as well, uh, if possible, and it's not, it's not easy, but if possible, try to find some additional funding that doesn't have the same challenges and restrictions as government grants. So if you can get support from private philanthropy or corporations or an annual appeal or board donations, that's going to create a little bit more breathing room on your finances. Now, if you're a social service nonprofit, and as we know from the poll earlier, many of our uh, attendees here are, um, and if you're doing safety net work, you're probably going to be mostly government funded. That's just who pays for those kinds of services. But again, the data shows that around that 80 or 85% mark on government support, there's kind of a cliff on your financial results and financial health. So if you can do enough diversification to get to 15 or 20 or 25% of that more flexible, unrestricted funding, general operating support, private donations, um, then you'll probably be in better shape than if you're up there at 90 or 95% government. But again, that's all easier said than done. That takes time and effort and investment of resources. And it's kind of a different business model to raise private funds. So um, not the easiest solution, but it's one that if you can pull it off is really important. Yes, and I just want to emphasize the, the working capital credit line. I've learned through the years that the right time to apply for a credit line is when you don't need it, when your balance sheet is strong. So encourage you to have that uh, line of credit in your toolkit even before you, uh, you need it. And so now I'd like to open it up. Mark, let us know what, uh, what questions you may have um, received from the audience. Thank you, Hilda. Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Hager. I'm one of three moderators for the Nonprofit Financial Commons. I'm joined by Dana Brito, who's on our panel today, and Wade Rogers. The most common place to see us will be in the, uh, in the, the forums that we still want to get rocking and rolling for the Nonprofit Financial Commons. That should be a very vibrant space once we get uh, more questions, more folks in there coming on a daily basis to uh, ask questions and, uh, and, uh, and, and have a lot, uh, interaction among uh, folks within the field. But we're here as well. We have these periodic webinars. Uh, people had a chance when they signed up to ask questions and that's where we, we, got, we got a lot, we got a lot of feedback there. We, we work through it. We look for the questions we think are gonna be most interesting to bring uh, to, to the group. Um, and we're, moder we're moderating the chat. I've got it over here on my other screen over here and some interesting questions coming up uh, there as well. We have a couple time periods here for me to share some of those questions with the, with the panelists. So, so here we are. Um, folks, can we uh, maybe distinguish for the crowd grants and contracts? Dana, your focus seemed to be on contracts, the opportunities, uh, restrictions that come with contracts. John, your research was focused on uh, government grants. Hilda, you seem to be more generally talking about business uh, model considerations for government funding generally. What distinction should we carry away between government grants and contracts? Uh, is an important distinction in terms of strategy 
or in terms of accounting, and how would it influence our, our business model considerations? So I'll, I'll take a stab at that. <laughs> um, government contracts, so the, the difference between grants and contracts is um, relates to the delivery, the deliverable, and who it's benefiting and how we account for that. And so in cost reimbursement contracts, we are accounting for it as the expenses are incurred because they need to be reimbursed. And so we can't earn it unless we've ex expensed it, like John said earlier. And in the, um, the actual contracts, um, there is some performance that's being done as a result and revenue is recognized based on the performance itself. I will say that the words are sometimes used interchangeably. And um, we actually had a different webinar on just recognizing revenue. And for anyone who was interested, I encourage you to listen to the recording on that webinar. But it really has to do with who's receiving the benefit and how, how are you able to earn that revenue based on the terms of the contract. Uh, Dana, anything you would say to extend your thoughts to grants or John, any reflections about what your, your graph might look like if we had contracts in there as well? I think the only um, thing that I will add is, sorry, John, I'll, I'll be quick, um, is that I think based, I think what Hilda said is right in terms of the rules of recognition, in terms of where you see this falling across the sector is that uh, um, typically, so in my experience, a lot of the arts and culture organizations that I work with typically receive grants and not fee-for-service contracts. So the revenue recognition rules are different. There's still pretty rigorous reporting requirements though tied to grants um, particularly, but the um, for organizations, it, again, depending on the, your, your service, your intervention and why you're applying and to your you're applying can impact whether you're getting a grant versus a fee-for-service contract. Yeah, um, I'll just say that I used the term grants in the uh, discussion and in the paper, basically because that's how the Form 990 uh, lists that particular category of funding. Um, so, it, you know, for Form 990 purposes, a grant is basically funding that's provided from a, a, a government source to a nonprofit organization. Uh, to provide services for the benefit of the general public rather than for the government itself. So if you have a con, if you work with, the, if you as a nonprofit work with the government uh, to provide training to government personnel or something like that, that's considered a contract that's reported differently from what we looked at on the 990. And as I, I mentioned, Medicare and Medicaid, those are programs that are not considered grants. Those are uh, uh, contractual services that, uh, that nonprofits provide. So the, you know, when we think about, you know, a lot of, again, those state and local level programs that fund homeless services, that fund, you know, uh, youth and education and after school programs, those would all in the terminology of the Form 990 be considered government grants. So most of the organizations that are here today, according to our, our second poll question, um, are pretty small uh, and may or may not be, uh, you know, have government money uh, right now, but want to pursue it. Should they? Uh, should smaller organizations be pursuing government money or are these restrictions uh, a real hurdle for getting into government funding? take a stab at that and then certainly invite my colleagues to, to chime in. I, you know, I don't think it's necessarily as easy to say that small organizations should not be receiving or should not go after government funding. I think it's really a, the, the key considerations, especially for, I think, for smaller organizations comes around being really thoughtful and reflective around your administrative capacity. So really taking a look at the systems that you have. And again, I, I had spent a lot of time talking because I'm a finance person talking about the accounting system, but there's 
very often programmatic data that you have to track and be very diligent about beyond just the financial data. And if you don't have the systems, the practices, the infrastructure to be doing that piece well, that can be a huge detriment to you as you maintain and manage these contracts going forward. So really thinking about the systems and the, the expertise, especially on, on the, the staffing side, I think you know staff can secure the training, but usually, especially if it's your first time around with government contracts, it's gonna take a little bit of a time to get that get those vouchers right, get those reports right. So leaving time for that, I think is especially important. And then I think on the business model side, I think we, again, we've talked a little bit about this. I think as it relates to your balance sheet, reserves are really key. So I think if you're, if you are a smaller organization and you're, um, then you're lucky enough to be in a position where you do have at least a few months of cash on hand or liquid resources on hand, that's fantastic because you will need those. And at some point we'll probably spend some of those, if not a significant portion of those. And then on the on the other hand, as it relates to the business model, again, really making sure that you have other sources of unrestricted income. It can be in the form of philanthropy and individuals, again, private philanthropy foundations or corporations. You may have other earned income generating models or um, social enterprise models that are able to cover costs and generate income in a reliable, repeatable way. But it's really up to you to be really be sure that you're doing that assessment and making sure that um, you're, you know, you're clear about those. So I think it's the the infrastructure and expertise combined with the, the cash and the, the fundraising capacity that I think is super important. And it's not necessarily that smaller or younger organizations don't have that, but typically it can be harder for smaller organizations, especially in the startup phase when everything is still being built from an infrastructural perspective. Um, it can be really hard to um, successfully perform at that level. John, let's hear from you and then I'll pass the torch to Hilda to move on to our case studies. Any reaction to what Dana's saying there about uh, how daunting it can be for organizations of any size, but especially smaller ones, to try to get in the government uh, funding game? Um, yeah, total agreement, basically. Um, you know, it's it's less to do with size than those kind of capacities and you know, that, that access to working capital or, or some cash to just, like I said, kind of start the process going uh, is really important. Those things are, are not impossible for smaller organizations, but they can be uh, a real hurdle. So I would be sure that, you know, those things are kind of lined up and ready to go before you embark on uh, that sort of government uh, funding uh, process. Uh, I mean, I, I guess the only thing I would add is just the whole um, kind of front end of things, just in terms of grant writing, in terms of understanding the relationships that exist, uh, you know, wh where your, you know, best um, fits might be with particular agencies or with particular funding streams. Those are all important part of the, the puzzle as well. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, John. I've got a whole page of questions here, more and more coming in in the chat as well. Let's uh, let's ask those questions in the forums uh, because we've got a you know, certain number of things that we can talk about uh, today. Hilda, we got some great case studies, I think, that we're going to move to next. We are. Thank you. And so now to our panel that I want to thank um, for taking the time to, to join us today and share their experience. I am going to begin by speaking with Ethan Evans, who is the past board chair of the Sacramento Self-Help <laughs> Housing in California. Welcome, Ethan, and thank you for being with us. We are looking forward to um, learning from your experience. And so I, I'd like to start by just giving you a chance to describe the organization. And um, I understand the organization experienced a significant growth from 3 million to 15 million dollars in, in government funding. And I'd love for you to share a little bit of the history and how did that happen and, and what happened? Thank you. It's great to be here and nice to see all the participants in the chat from all over the country and different organizations. Uh, Sacramento Self-Help Housing houses people. Uh, everybody, I'm sure in many of your towns, homelessness is on the rise. That has been true in Sacramento. Uh, the organization was founded in the 90s by, you know, kind of a classic charismatic founder story, um, serving people in what we know as Friendship Park, uh, which is just a place that homeless people are allowed to be operated by a number of churches and through uh, donations. And that spun off into a nonprofit. And it went on as a small concern for uh, 
for a good while of its existence with kind of a kitchen cabinet board. Um, and what it was doing was different than what other people were doing because it targeted trying to house the hardest to house. Those with the least income, the most uh, deficits in terms of you know capacity for daily living. And it became successful, slow and slow and slow. And it was through government contracts nearly completely that this organization grew. And, you know, its first grant was a HUD grant, felt very excited about it, um, used its small staff to figure out how to do it. And since they learned it, they could do it. Uh, but and when you, you know, success get, begets success and the train started running, combined with then the exp kind of explosion of the popularity to address homelessness. It's an odd phrase to think about, but that's really what happened. Uh, we saw huge growth and that 3 million to 15 uh, million was a change between 2017 and 2020. So big time growth, short time span after 15 years of being, you know, really a peanuts, bubble gum and shoestring organization, but doing great work in the community. And so and you asked how and why things went bad. Yes. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know that any there. Well, in the beginning, I'm not sure that anybody outside would say things went bad. This organization worked with these types of growth for, you know, three to five years without too much hiccups outwardly. Internally, a um, couple things. We didn't have a board or a CEO who could say no. Uh, and it was more, so, and so, you know, I think what, to the question of do we know if we're ready, stage out what one wants to do. I think each of the pieces that I heard today about infrastructure that you want to have in place, working capital that you want to have in place, the, classic lessons to learn. Here's an example of an organization that didn't follow those lessons. Um, and it's slow at first, starting to fall behind on your contracting, seeing that that somebody brought up a great point, the intimate relationship between program data and financial data that's needed in the government uh, contracts is if those systems don't get put in place early, they quickly get overworked. And I do think, you know, as an organization that houses homeless people, we're we're used to duct tape and and you know and spit to get things done. It's just what what we do. And I think that sense of our of I think the organization's sense of itself, that cultural domain of who we were as a scrappy organization, also got the better of us. And so I think those are some early things um, that both from the technical standpoint, but also from kind of a cultural who we were uh, standpoint that, you know, started to, started the why or how did things go wrong. And so Ethan, I, I implied that some things went wrong and you've mentioned it. Um, how wrong did things go? What, where is the organization today before we dig a little bit deeper into what might have contributed to it? Yeah, so May 24th, uh, I signed Chapter 7 bankruptcy papers. Uh, and so there is a trustee appointed by a federal court right now sorting through whatever records are there to uh, see which creditors can be paid. Um, I'll just mention I was a, a board member, general board member, up until January 9th, when we recognized what sort of financial crisis we were in, and we moved the CEO into administrative leave, not for any nefarious, but just we needed somebody who could sort this out. And then we appointed a new CEO. I was elected chair of the board with the mission of find out what's going on, can we fix it? And we spent five months pursuing different routes of that to um, realize that Chapter 7 bankruptcy was the, was the path. And that was the way we could best protect and ensure the most amount of people who could stay housed would stay housed. Most people who could stay employed could stay employed somewhere and that we could pay the most people back that were owed money. 
Thank you, Ethan, for sharing. And again, sometimes when these things happen, it's hard to learn because it's hard to speak to those who can share. And so thank you for being here with us. Looking back, uh, what do you think management board or stakeholders should have seen um, coming? I mean, honestly, it's many of the things we've heard. I mean, the stages of growth idea, just studying that can be very instructive. You know, I wish when I came onto the board in 2019, I saw some of these things like, oh, this is a classic development story. I, and just that amount of growth without the leadership development and then professionalization, like that should have been the first thing. Like just the key lesson of if you're going through transition, how is the leadership going to change? And without Rex seeing a change, I think that's a flag right there that I wish someone would have said, hey, wait a minute, we might need something else. And I don't think the that happened early on and one of the things i've the leadership style needs to change with the types of stages that you're going through and one of the things that i think was crucial i don't know if we ever got out of the direct stage because i remember learning about um you know the ways that the ceo was really integrated into day-to-day -day, you know hr decisions did every interview and the board, too, was because it had long been this uh, kitchen cabinet type board, was very enmeshed in the operations. Classic signs of, hey, problem here. We're now a $16 million organization, or we think we are. The board shouldn't be, you know, having program type meetings. Uh, we have new roles, too. And so I think those are some stages that we could, that could have been paid attention to. And it, it's not un, untread ground, I guess, is part of the lesson. And so if you, if you, I think for those on the call, if they're thinking about going into government contracting, think about the stage at which your organization is from the classic examples. And are you with wide eye, open eyes pursuing those government contracts? I think you want to be in the position of choice rather than what also happened to us. We got flooded with money because one, uh, the topic got hot. Two, we were doing work that nobody, like in two ways, we were doing work that nobody would do. One, because we were working with hard to work with folks. And also what I learned later is we were taking contracts that nobody else would take. And so that's something with government funding. Talk to your colleagues in the area and find out their expense experience. If they've looked at the contract and passed on it, ask them why because maybe you missed something. Um, and yeah, I, I, be careful of gifts that keep coming. Thank you, Ethan. Appreciate it. We'll have some time for additional questions for you. Um, again, thank you for, for sharing those experiences with us. Um, I'd like to now uh, speak to Corey. And Corey is the Chief Financial Officer of Kutaska Community Action. And um, here to share from the CFO's perspective what it's like um, to work in an organization that is heavy government funded. And so, Corey, um, tell us what, what your organization's work is about and what does um, what do you see as the role of government funding and the role that it's playing right now? And I'm going to do that, assist your storytelling by sharing um, what you shared with us, with the participants. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Corey Smith, Chief Financial Officer of Kutaska Community Action. Um, just briefly, Kutaska is one of more than a thousand community action agencies nationwide. We focus primarily on the fight against poverty. Uh, so we serve two of the largest counties in rural northern Minnesota, and we offer programming in early childhood education, energy assistance and weatherization, um, crisis and transitional housing services, and community engagement, to name a few of the of the larger areas of programming. Um, from the pie chart that Hilda brought up, you can see that government funding simply plays a, a large part in what we do and how we offer our programming. So roughly 74% of our total revenue last year was from government funding in general. Um, specifically, federal funding made up roughly 58% of that total. And over the years, even upwards of 85 to 90% government funding is very typical for Kutaska. So managing 
that type of funding is critical to us. Um, but in a nutshell, John and his awesome research that he laid out for everybody really well sums up Putaska's relationship with government funding. And so as I think about the life of a CFO within a heavy government funded organization, I know that there's a lot to, to manage. And I wanna thank you for sharing the, uh, the dashboard that you monitor. Uh, we love dashboards and love the stories that it, they tell. So this is, um, this is your dashboard that has a few stories. And we, uh, we look at the, the signal lights, so red, yellow, and green. And um, we'd love to just understand um, why you chose these metrics. And are these metrics that maybe others on the call should really be measuring, um, quantifying and measuring over time if they're in this um, level of funding? Sure. So really where this started a handful of years ago was to try to give Kutaska's board of directors a, a more straightforward, high level view of the financial health of the agency. And truly, I started with some research of my own to really kind of get a better sense of what those most important or kind of primary indicators of a nonprofit's financials would be and really kind of settled on probably close to seven or 10 different indicators. And so over time, we've worked to develop those. Of course, the, the numbers themselves change um, based on kind of the inner workings of the agency and our different programs. Um, but you can see that, that this dashboard, or at least a snippet of it, really focuses on that select group um, and while, like I mentioned, those those ratios or types of ratios that that are tracked can change, uh, we tend to focus these days on the indicators specific to current assets, cash, and the level of reliance on government. Um, so, like Hilda mentioned, we we use what I refer to as a traffic light approach, um, really kind of trying to trying to speak to the different um, understandings and, and learning approaches of the audience. So know your audience when you're presenting these financials. Um, we use that green, yellow, and red formatting. And that really helps to focus the conversation and communicate the data in a different way. So for instance, more recently, you can kind of see some, some kind of bold, maybe ominous colors in those, uh, those red, red mm -hmm. cells. And we saw a tightening of current assets and, and cash which uh, showed up in those, those ratios, as you can see. Um, from there, kind of depending on the root causes, or maybe it's a single cause of, of what's really kind of driving those changes, and into, in this case, kind of a decline in cash, um, we can dig into that and really kind of see from that agency perspective where we as leadership need to dive in and, and do our best to address the issue. Um, but at this point, back to again, John's, John's research, while Luna isn't really a part of our dashboard or specific metric at this point, I actually have a finance committee meeting this afternoon, and I might just float that idea past them. Thank you. Luna should be in every dashboard, at every finance committee. Thank you for, for thinking about that. Um, so running on, on 20 or so days of cash, that's one of your metrics here. What does that reality look like day to day? for you? I'm not going to lie. It, it can be a stressful reality, um, especially if you're used to seeing days cash noticeably higher um, than that in the past. And so with that tightening of cash that I mentioned, um, that the day-to-day -day focus changes, has to change. Uh, we oftentimes say there's a big difference between kind of working on the agency from a strategic standpoint versus working in the agency from kind of that more detailed hands-on perspective and some call it working in the weeds. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it can really feel like those weeds that you're working in just get thicker and thicker. Um, reviewing and managing the bank balance uh, becomes a, a daily task. Deeper oversight in the, the accounts payable, accounts receivable and, and cash requesting functions um, becomes a reality and really kind of more strategy and, and execution are required when it comes to the timing of cash inflows and outflows. And so for Kutaska, that meant working with our bank to secure an operating line of credit, which was something brand new to the agency in its um, 60 plus year existence. And so 
suggesting that line of credit may raise some eyebrows at first, um, and it certainly needs to be managed appropriately, but it can definitely provide the leverage and flexibility needed to, to weather those timing differences that can especially impact cash. And so for CFOs on the call, um, anything else you would say from the financial leadership perspective that you would want them to track or keep keep the board informed of? Maybe back to some of Ethan's, if I knew then what I know now, um, I might have done something differently. Any other, any final words of advice? Yeah, I think um, really kind of, like I mentioned before, knowing and understanding the audience and knowing who you're, you're speaking with and really kind of working alongside really helps. Um, we, we sit in the fiscal department here at Kutaska and how we think or approach a situation or a challenge um, can be very different from how uh, a board member, especially one that may not have uh, a deeper fiscal knowledge. So really kind of understanding that there is that, that knowledge gap and, and working towards that to educate um, the entire group. So where I would kind of start, first of all, is to kind of really um, secure that understanding that not all federal dollars or grants are the same. Um, of course, uh, I saw some comments come up in the chat. You know, there are different federal agencies or departments um, nationwide, of course, but government grantees um, like Kutaska, you'll see varying grant periods, um, different compliance and reporting requirements, and different levels of availability or even access to the cash requests and reimbursements through those government agencies. Um, and then, of course, add on to that those business model considerations that you talked about, Hilda, earlier. Mm -hmm. um, what I would kind of add to that, if I, I could quickly, for any any potential or, or existing sources of government funding, like, like Ethan had mentioned, make sure you know what you're dealing with. Um, as well as what your organization's needs and capacities are. Really kind of do your best to understand the, the structure and requirements of those existing or, or potential funding sources um, and help to make sure that your organization is pursuing and securing the, the right dollars, not just really any dollar. Um, we wanna make sure, of course, that we're working to, to fulfill the mission with every, every dollar secured and spent. Um, and really kind of uh, in the end, it's making sure you have a strong team alongside you through the process, um, bringing what you can to the table, um, really kind of diversifying the, the strengths and perspectives on that team, leaning on those experts and professionals that work alongside you. And, and really lastly, in my opinion, when challenges arise, work to maintain a level of transparency around the issue and really kind of ensure that there's clear communication and teamwork present in addressing the issue. And like you mentioned, Hilda, um, a government grant is, is really just a partnership in the end. So what may look like a challenge now could just be kind of that, that new opportunity in disguise. Thank you, Corey. That is truly inspirational. I am going to open it up for Mark to let us know what additional questions might have come up um, and uh, happy to see if we can answer them. Great, thank you, Hilda. Uh, we have time to probably put, you know, a question or two. Probably just question to Corey and to to Ethan. Um, uh, Corey, I'd like for you to have to just kind of continue riffing off a, a question that Hilda started to ask. There, you're the one guy in the room who's working in an organization in finance for an organization that is, you know, very heavily uh, financed by government, whereas most of your audience here is working in organizations that don't have so much government money. So I, I'd like to have you riff a little bit more about uh, what what's it like? You know, what's unique for organizations like yours in terms of like applying for government money and having accounting systems for dealing with government money, uh, specific accounting standards related to uh, having government money and reporting back to government on the money that you, you've spent. What do you go through? What would you say to folks in the room? Boy, to try to succinctly touch on all of those different pieces, um, like you said, there's really a lot of compliance. There's a lot of requirements. Um, making sure that that foundation and that understanding is in place and that you're really not just kind of chasing that next potential dollar. So I, I think really kind of having to put the, 
the effort into the infrastructure, first of all, understanding what your organization's um, needs, capacities, and even limitations are um, at the, the current point in time. And then from there, where are your opportunities for growth? Um, of course, if you're looking to expand in, in one direction, that would likely um, kind of reduce the, the number of possible sources of funding or grants from the government that you would look to pursue. Uh, and of course, there, like you mentioned, um, gap accounting, everything through through an audit process, um, single audit, you know, there's a lot of terms and phrases that could be thrown out there to kind of add to that possible negative connotation, but um, really kind of like Ethan suggested, reaching out to your your partners, your, your neighboring or kind of uh, um, related organizations that maybe have been through it, or of course, using the nonprofit financial commons, using the, the platforms available to you to just make sure you have a good solid understanding of what what you're getting into, what it could entail, and and that you have that right uh, system and infrastructure in place before diving in. Good. Okay. Thank you, Corey. Uh, Ethan, let's let's talk about your case briefly here. Uh, you and I got to talk briefly uh, last week about this, about how this case of yours reminded me of when I was studying nonprofits and when I was in graduate school. And I talked to a number of organizations that closed when they were in the process of expanding, usually we think about organizations going under when they're losing resources, but uh, you're reminding me of that interesting phenomenon of organizations not being able to handle what's coming at them. Uh, I often run into folks that think that when an organization is closing, it's always a financial issue, but I've always pushed back against that idea. To what extent is your case here that you described for us, to what case is this a financial issue that we're dealing with here versus a organizational culture or developmental issue? How much of it is financial? Yeah, I mean, it would be, that'd be an interesting pie chart to parse out. You know, at the end of the day, it's dollars and cents, but you don't get to that place without missing the things that we've talked about, without putting, you know, hiring a CFO that has the capacity of a CFO, uh, without developing the systems internally that um, that can handle the data transfer that you need. Um, here's just an anecdote from this organization. So earlier we mentioned the need for fundraising, right? We were 90 something plus percent uh, government contracts. It's not that nobody knew that that was a problem. It's just nothing concrete. Infrastructure, culture was put in place to drive fundraising. So when I came onto the board and said, okay, let's do something, I asked, give me a list of every donor that's given $100. 20 years of operation, I got a list of 60 people. It didn't have complete addresses, phone numbers, or emails for every one of them. I mean, just an example of the type of infrastructure that have that in place before, because you're going to have to buffer that uh, government grant. And so it goes into the planning and the cultural mindset of who you are as an organization. Um, we were so led by the heart of anything to serve the next homeless person that there was that the there wasn't a counterbalance to say, hey, wait a minute, does this work? Does it pencil? And so I think that is equally culture and actual finances. Ethan, was there another path here where SSHH survived? What would that have taken? Or was this an inevitability? Well, uh, I mean, the other, so what things that I saw, there was a cloud of sort of denial and it's just around the cornerism that was mm -hmm. devastating. So every, the, the main, the older members of the board and the CEO were trapped in that. So there's always going to be something that was going to work. It never came. And then just kind of a blindness. There is a scenario in 2000, you know, we also had bad luck. We had a CFO that we hired that died six months later. We entered the pandemic where, in, where costs went up and fundraising and revenues went down. So those types of things are there. The scenario, and the County of Sacramento approved a million dollars in what was called ARPA funding, but never delivered. 
And so there was a possible scenario where we might have been able to weather the financial storm, hopefully with enough clarity to then fix the infrastructural components, probably as a smaller organization, having shed some programs to some other groups. I think there was a path we saw, we were looking for it, and we realized in the time and the depth of where we were, it just wasn't impossible. It was an impossible reach. And we would have hurt more people who were housed, employed, and owed money if we'd have continued to pursue that uh, out of some hope uh, that that it could be done. And, and you know, sometimes you would sometimes you just have to swallow the frog. That's the phrase I use. It's like it ain't pretty and it doesn't taste good, but here's where we are, and and we we're able to protect a lot of people. Uh, by by making that choice. Okay, great, Ethan. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Bill. I'll hand back to you for wrap ups. Thank you, thank you all uh, so much. I'd like to now pass the baton to um, Ruth McCambridge, our content leader for the Financial Commons. Ruth. Hi, um, Ethan. You you make me want to cry. Um, I, I could really feel that in the middle of my chest, um, having been in similar situations, and it's it's so tough. One of the um, one of the participants said, um, listening to you, that this is wisdom born of pain, and um, it really is. It's so important for us to hear how it really happens and what it really means and what you do. Um, at various times to try to um, just just stop the bleeding um, in a much larger sense and save what you can. Um, so I deeply appreciate Corey and Ethan both. I think your stories are just profound. And I hope everybody remembers them um, as they're working and that there's pieces of that that they say, oh, I remember the story and I remember where it ends. I remember what it means um, and, and work on that. The uh, nonprofit financial commons was actually set up specifically to capture this kind of wisdom um, and to make sure that you are able to access it. Uh, all of our participants are able to access it as quickly as they need it. Um, and so uh, what you bring as, as a membership or participants, the people who are on our site, which is still very new, is uh, both the wisdom of your questions. Oh my God, I'm feeling this, what does it mean? I see this happening, what does it mean? And the wisdom of your answers, oh, I was there, um, or I saw a neighboring organization go through that. Um, here's what I know, here's what I would recommend to, lead, to read, here's the tools that I might use. Um, and so I think what I wanna do uh, second after I thank everybody who presented here um, is just to point people towards the resource list, which you can see on the uh, scene right, on, on the screen right now, the resource list for this particular um, uh, session. And we do invite people to recommend additional resources um, that, that you think that we should be um, sharing with people. So if you can think of additional resources that you, that you think would be helpful to people in that whole continuum of organizations that were here today, please help us and share that. The second thing is that um, the forums, which are moderated by, um, by uh, Mark and Wade and Dana, who's, um, who presented early on in this session, are uh, only as brilliant as you make them. And that means that we need both your questions and your answers. I hope that everybody here will check into our forums on the website um, this, this week and log your questions. What we do when you log your questions is we do a reach out and ask people for their answers. And so it's an incredibly important part of what we do. We also get our guidance about what these kinds of events should cover from the kinds of questions that you ask. Um, so you are our primary source for 
the information that gets covered here. Um, uh, we're going to leave the um, we're, we're going to leave the chat area open for a few minutes so people can log any additional questions they have, um, make any comments about how today went for you, what, what you think we could be doing additionally and differently. Um, and, um, and, you know, if, if you are so driven, we would love to know if you're, if you're interested in, in fact, becoming a uh, panelist in one of our sessions um, and making your own contribution to that wisdom born through pain. <laughs> or maybe it's not so painful for you, but um, there were a lot of things that kept me up at night when I was a primary financial person at the organizations that I worked in. So um, with that, I will um, thank you for being here and for your participation and um, thank all of the panelists and the moderators for helping us to make sense of what it were really, it looked like about 100 people participating in this, in this single conversation. Again, finally, thank you, Corey. Thank you, um, Ethan. And thank you, John, for being so perceptive as to see where a piece of research would be ultimately extremely useful in clarifying an important common experience. Thank you. And um, we will see you next month when we do a, a session on a business model that, that is focused on foundation funding. Thank you.